Okay, we're gonna talk about the humerus and answer the questions, what is the humerus? What are its primary bony landmarks? And what are some reasons to learn about it? Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Morton and I'm the noted anatomist. So to get started, the humerus is the principal bone of the arm. We take a look, there it is, the humerus, the principal bone of the arm. And it gets its name because humerus is Latin for shoulder, not so much funny, but so much shoulder. Um, and we see that the humerus articulates proximally with the scapula at the glenohumeral joint, or also known as your shoulder joint, and it articulates distally with the radius and ulna at the elbow for the hinge and pivot joints. And we see the following structures are what we are now going to cover, those principal bony landmarks and why each of them are significant in anatomy. So let's start uh, by showing that we're going to be using a right anterior view of the humerus and a right posterior view of the humerus primarily to show these structures. Let's get started. First one, anatomist said, well, this thing is round and it's smooth and it's dome shaped, kind of like this. So we're going to call it the head, the head of the humerus. And we'll see that the head of the humerus articulates with the glenoid cavity of the scapula and together they make the glenohumeral joint that has a lot of mobility. Not as much stability, but a lot of mobility. And also the head of the humerus is only about a third of it. A third of the humeral head articulates with the glenoid cavity. Next, we have this structure that's just below the head of the humerus. And so anatomist said, well, in anatomy, that's the neck. But there's another neck just below this. We'll call this one the anatomical neck because it's the one right below the head. Um, this one they call the surgical neck that we see circumscribing all the way around. The dotted line is not showing a break. It's actually just showing the circumference. That whole area is the surgical neck of the humerus. And it's significant clinically because uh, coming out of the quadrilateral, uh, uh, the quadrilateral space, there's a nerve called the axillary nerve as well as the posterior humeral circumflex artery. And they wrap around the back of the surgical neck of the humerus right along there, that surgical neck. Now what we see is if you have a surgical neck fracture like this x-ray is showing in the proximal humerus, the nerve most likely injured would be the axillary nerve. Uh, next, we have these two things, and the anatomist said, well, these look like a bump and they look like swelling, so the word we use is tubercle or tuberosity. And if these are tubercles, well, this one is bigger than the other one, so we'll call this one the greater tubercle and this one the lesser tubercle. And we'll see that the greater tubercle is primarily on the lateral side of the proximal humerus, but it wraps all the way around the back as well. And so we can see that in this posterior view of the scapula, the greater tubercle forms an attachment for the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and the teres minor muscles, three of our four rotator cuff muscles. So let's do this. Let's then show this view, a proximal view of a photograph of the proximal humerus where you can see the greater tubercle and we go around laterally, that whole space is the greater tubercle and we see if we keep going around the back, that greater tubercle is quite large on the side and back of the humerus, okay? Greater tubercle. The next is this one in front in the proximal humerus called the lesser tubercle, sometimes lesser tuberosity. And here we see uh, the right scapula in an anterior view, and that lesser tubercle serves as an attachment for the subscapularis muscle there in blue, the fourth of our rotator cuff muscles. And so here we see a proximal view of this, um, of this uh, humerus, and that whole area and outlined in yellow is the lesser tubercle. And if we see if we rotate around, you'll see that the lesser tubercle is not quite as large as the greater tubercle. Now, anatomist said, what do we call this groove between the greater and lesser tubercles? Well, why don't we call it the groove between the lesser and greater tubercles, or the groove between the tubercles, hence the name, the intertubercular groove, just like that. But anatomists also saw that, hey, the long head of the biceps brachii muscle goes between the lesser and greater tubercle. Hmm, that intertubercular groove could have another name. We'll also call it the bicipital groove. Next, we have this groove on the back of the mid shaft of the humerus, right there. So anatomists said, well, what do we call this? What we see is that there's the radial nerve that courses all along the back of this. And they said, well, why don't we call this then the radial groove? And because it makes a spiral kind of shape, we'll call it the spiral groove as well. Um, and this is significant because not only the radial artery, but the deep brachial artery also course in that groove. And if you have a mid-humeral fracture as shown in this x-ray, then the radial nerve is the nerve most likely injured. 
All right, next is we have this little tuberosity there on the side of the uh, mid shaft of the humerus, a little bit more proximal probably than the arrow is showing. And they said, well, it's a tuberosity and the deltoid muscle attaches to it. So let's call it the deltoid tuberosity. The illustration does not show it as well. So we'll show a photograph that shows it a little bit better. It's an anchor point or insertion for the deltoid muscle. Next, we see this structure. And that structure helps to form the pivot joint, I, I lied, the hinge joint, excuse me, of the elbow, the synovial hinge joint. And it looks and functions much like the pulley. And so anatomists said, well, why don't we just call it the pulley? Except they weren't speaking in English, it was Latin, so they called it the trochlea. And that's what trochlea means. Uh, this one, anatomists said, well, it's round and smooth and dome-shaped. Hey, much like this, so we're gonna call it the head. But hold, us, hold the phone for a second. We already have a head of the humerus. So anatomists were like, well, we can't call it the head of the humerus. We'll call it the capitulum, which in Latin means head. I know, I know. Those anatomists are cheeky monkeys. So that capitulum then forms an articulation with the radial head so that when the radial head pronates or supinates and you see that pivot motion going on between the radial head and the capitulum, the smooth, uh, rounded uh, shape of the capitulum uh, helps to facilitate that pronation, supination, pivot motion. This is called the trochlea, and this is the capitulum. They're both considered condyles because they, that's Latin for a knuckle or knob at the end of the bone. So anatomists then looked at these two structures and said, well, what do we call them? Well, this thing is on the medial side of the humerus, and it's above the condyle, so we'll call it the medial epicondyle. Medial, the inside, epi for upon the condyle, the trochlea. So this one then is called the lateral epicondyle on the side of the humerus above the condyle, the capitulum. Now that lateral epicondyle is there in surface anatomy and it serves as an origin for our forearm extensor muscles, uh, the, primarily the muscles on the back of your forearm. Now the medial epicondyle is much bigger, more prominent, and it's on the medial side of the distal humerus, and it serves as an attachment for many of the forearm flexor muscles. And so those forearm flexor muscles are on the front of the forearm. It also, that medial epicondyle, is a landmark for the ulnar nerve, which courses down, all the way down, and then deep or behind that medial epicondyle through something called the cubital tunnel. And so here we see that medial epicondyle, that surface anatomy of the medial epicondyle, and I superimpose the humerus, and that dotted circle is meant to represent that medial epicondyle. And the medial epicondyle is known as the funny bone. It's not really funny, haha. -ha. I actually don't even really know why it's called the funny bone. But there the ulnar nerve courses all the way around, and it ends with cutaneous sensation to your pinky and ring finger, part of the ring finger, so that when you hit the nerve at the elbow, like when you hit it on the side of a corner of a chair, it causes the funny feeling or the numbness in the hand. Ha 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 ha. I know, really funny. Um, so here's the humerus on the left side, and we zoom in, you see the medial epicondyle, and then there is the ulnar nerve as it courses and goes deep or behind the medial epicondyle before going down into the forearm. And so if you have a medial epicondyle fracture as shown right here, then you could uh, disrupt or stretch or hurt the ulnar collateral ligament, but also the ulnar nerve as it courses behind there. So to review, there is the medial epicondyle of the humerus, which is a common origin for the forearm flexor muscles, which tendons go into the palm of the hand. And there is the surface landmark for the lateral epicondyle, common attachment for the forearm extensor muscles, and those tendons go in the back of the hand. We see these two shallow concave surfaces, one in the front and one in the back of the distal humerus. So we use the word fossae, fossa for singular, fossae for plural. This one is called the coronoid fossa the one on the front. The one on the back that's deeper is called the olecranon fossa. And so here we have the medial aspect of the right elbow and you notice we can do this kind of hinge motion, not kind of, but a definitely a hinge motion in the, in the uh, elbow. So when the elbow is straight, the elbow is extended and we see this olecranon process of the ulna, which is Latin for, olecranon is Latin for elbow. It's the bony part of your elbow that you rest on a table. It then moves into that olecranon fossa of the humerus, which is why we are able to extend your elbow straight. Now, when you have the elbow flexed, the coronoid process of the ulna moves into the coronoid fossa of the humerus. Now, let's do a little bit of review, shall we?
So we look at this and you think, well, what's that yellow thing? Well, it's the distal part of the humerus. It looks like a pulley trochlea. What about this one? Well, that is a bumper swelling on the front of the proximal humerus. It's smaller than the other one. So this is the lesser tubercle. What about this one? Well, that's a shallow little pit or pothole on the front of the distal humerus. That's the smaller one. That's the coronoid process of the humerus. What about this one? Well, that's that space or groove between the two tubercles. So we'll call it the intertubercular groove or bicipital groove or sulcus. What about this? Well, that's that shallow concave pit on the back of the distal humerus, a lecranon fossa. And what about this? Well, that's that really big tubercle or tuberosity. That's the greater tubercle or greater tuberosity. And this one, oh, that's the, in green. That's the thing above the condyle on the medial side. That's the medial epicondyle. And that, my friends, is the humerus in a nutshell.